of Romans, and we'll start our equipment. Romans, chapter 10. <clears throat> Verse 11. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And the hymn of that is the dead one, the one who was crucified, the lamb, the criminal, the, the outcast, the, uh, the God that became uh, crucified um, and uh, did it in faith, did it in faith, in the faith. He functioned by the faith. And as such, he <clears throat> um, died an innocent death on his part um, and as we discussed last class period, the soul that sinneth shall die, and since he didn't sin, he didn't deserve to die, so he was raised up from the dead. Uh, one of the many reasons why he was raised up from the dead. <clears throat> but uh, that was brought up last class so that we could see the difference between his death and sometimes our attempts at trying to lay down our life. <clears throat> when there's not gonna be, you know, there's only a resurrection out of that death. Just somebody falling over out on the street here and dies there's no guarantee of a resurrection as far as in in the lord uh gonna happen based on just the fact that he died <clears throat> it is a certain kind of death um <clears throat> okay so let me read a little more because i didn't actually finish the subtopic of what we were on last time which was the promise of life coming through death when we hearken back to the ancient paths which we talked about in the beginning of this course, we see that Judah, before captivity to Babylon, did not believe in or have the faith of Abraham. Okay. <clears throat> now this is, they're, they're the seed of Abraham. And remember when Jesus came and said something about Abraham, um, they got all huffy, the Jews did, and the Pharisees, and said, you know, we are the seed of Abraham, and we're, you know, da-da-da-da. And um, Jesus' Jesus's response was, you know, worse than mine. He said, you're of your father, the devil. That was his response. Um, but Judah, um, they, didn't, they didn't have the right kind of belief about God. That was the whole deal. They, and therefore, they were in confusion. Anybody ever been in confusion about the dealing of God? A lot of times it comes down to this right here. Because we don't, we don't really understand God. We don't really understand. When I say we don't understand God, we go, well, you know, uh, the Lord moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. First of all, that's not in the Bible. And second of all, um, he's not trying to be mysterious. He'd like for us to know him. He sent the Holy Spirit so that that could happen. Um, <clears throat> And many times the confusion is just flat out. We don't really understand that concept that I had on the board that I raised called life out of death. What God means by that. What God, not, not our little, you know, well, if you die, then you're going to be raised. No. But a life comes out of a certain kind of death, which we'll, we'll delve into more and more as we go here. But that, without understanding that, then... Jeremiah is preaching and saying, don't stop fighting Babylon. Give in to them. Lay down your life. Don't resist. Da -da -da -da. And they're going, this is stupid. These, these are heathen. These are undeserving, wretched people. And we should, we, you know, we need to kill them. That's what we need to do. And they're thinking, okay, this is God's plan. This is how God works. God wants to kill everybody that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, which would include them. Yeah, I mean, how stupid is that? But, but that just shows you the depth of self-deception about what we can think when we get in those situations. You know, I'm just telling you, 
you can become overwhelmed with the, you know, something somebody does or says or whatever, and you get, you just get fixated on it, and then all you can see is what's wrong with them, and, you know, that's fine, because in light of life out of death or in light of Christ crucified, it's important to know they don't deserve death. That's part of the whole deal. That was the big manifestation on the cross, was they don't deserve it. Not even a little bit. This is God's great love. Okay. So Judah is going, this isn't, this isn't right. This is wrong. This is bad. This is, you know, this shouldn't be happening. And here we're surrounded by the enemy, and they're going to eventually come over these walls, and they're going to tear up what is holy. And God doesn't want what is holy torn up. Well, folks, Jesus was the most holy thing that there was. And he let him be torn up by the enemy, who by wicked hands had taken and murdered, crucified the prince of life. Okay, so, so, what if, what if I told you from now on, any issue that arose where it was between you and somebody who didn't deserve it, automatically think this is the opportunity for the cross. How many of you would be able to do that faithfully from now on? <laughs> How many of you would even think of it? Because here's the deal, if your mind's not renewed, to the faith, if your mind's not renewed to the faith, guess what? Almost every time, except maybe after a good sermon, then you go out and somebody mistreats you and go, I'll just lay down my life. Of course, you know, of course, many times that's not by the nature of Christ when we do that. That's us trying to be Christ like, and God doesn't accept it. There is no resurrection out of that one. There is no resurrection out of that death. Um, but what if God said to you, I want you for the rest of your walk to walk by faith, life out of death. I want you to walk by this faith. I want you to walk by the faith of Abraham who looked at his own deadness and said, I don't deserve anything, but you are a God that brings life out of death and calls those things which be not as though they were and began to see not some sort of miracle razzmatazz in those scriptures, but a selfless giving that says, I'll be the dead one so that life can come forth in them. You say, for what purpose? That, what purpose? They, they don't deserve it. Never, never in the faith do they deserve it. Never. They don't. Never. And did you have a comment? And, and uh, I was thinking about, well, skip that. Anyway, if after I read this paragraph, it's probably I've already said it all anyway. When we hearken back to the ancient paths which we talked about in the beginning of this course, we see that Judah before captivity to Babylon did not believe in or have the faith of Abraham. What was it that they did not believe? There were several things. First, they did not believe that they should have to die at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, but that it was the evil Babylonians that should die. This proves that they knew nothing concerning the way of God as seen in death and resurrection. They didn't know anything of it. And they resisted and fought, and they, they hated Jeremiah. They hated him, folks. They hated him for preaching that. They hated him. And they were always trying to kill him, and the king had to, you know, would, would tie him into rope, and they had this big mire pit, and they'd let him down through this hole into this dark pit and, you know, soak him in the stuff, you know, and just, just tie it off and leave him there, you know. And he only had a couple of people that would even come visit him or stuff like that. Why? Because he preached Christ crucified. Now, why would, be, why would people react that way? 
Why, I mean, why would they react that way? Well, first of all, they don't want to lay down their life. If it's not Christ, they want to preserve their life. Can I get amen? They want to. They want to. In fact, what is the, the most powerful human motive? They, they say self-preservation. You know, and, and so it will rise and they will kill you, you know. And it's like, okay, preach this only in relation to Jesus on the cross and him doing it, and I love it. That churches are full of people that go, yes, thank you for doing that, you know. Well, do you intend on ever doing that? Not a bit, man. I'm going to live for myself. But thank God, God preserved this, this me so I could live for myself for eternity. Ain't going to happen. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do have some insurance. I mean, something happened, happened to me at work that it's the Lord is still dealing with me on it and still sharing with me. And there was, there was a time where I just wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't right in my spirit, you know, and, I, and because I wasn't, I was working nine to nothing, I mean, trying to make up for it, you know, yeah. because you know, the Lord will be in you doing something because you want to, you know, put your hands, when you put your hands, you want to be the Lord, yeah. you know, and, and and I got critical in my spirit, you know, towards a brother who, who I was working with, and, you know, he'd always be looking at me, always watching, you know, he, you know, I even, you know, did the did this thing like, you know, hey, you know, God's watching you. He's always watching you. And I started getting critical and thinking, man, he's not doing his job. He's not, you know. And, and then he started picking on my stuff, which I thought, you know, I, I'm doing the best I possibly can ever. And there's no way he can find any flaw, but he's watching, he's watching. And he just, he found the opportunity to show me something that, that I did wrong or or that I forgot this little tiny thing here and started to put it in my face in such a vehement way that I, it was starting to shake me. But I, I said the right things. I was saying, you know what? You know, let's work together. And, you know, let's try to, you know, we're brothers in the Lord. You know, people don't want to see this happening, you know, and they want to see believers not getting along. And I was saying all the right things, but inside I was so critical right. and going, how can you possibly be judging me? You don't even do your job. You're stealing. You, I mean, all these things are going my mind because I'm in my carnal mind thinking these things. And the Lord started, I mean, hollering at me and to where I knew it was him. He's like, submit to me. Submit to me. And I'm, I'm trying to get away from him, you know. But I knew that he wanted me to submit to him. But it was through him, yeah. you know, and I, and, I, and I started ignoring it, and I went to him, and I said, look, you know, brother, and I started, I started just trying to share the Lord with him and stuff, and it got even more riled up, and, and the Lord said, it doesn't matter what you say, this is me, submit to me, and it just went on until I, I just, I, it, broke, it broke me, and I just, I came to him, and I said, okay, and he's my coworker. He's not my boss. Right. And I was, you know, right. and so I said, okay, you know, what is it that you want me to do? And and I, I submitted to the Lord, but in Him, and and it broke and stopped, you know. But it was it was it was so much because I wasn't with the Lord. It was like He had to yell at me to do that, and and it hurt me, you know, to yeah. to know that I wasn't with the Lord enough to yeah. submit to Him. But to thinking, this guy, he doesn't deserve me to do what he wants me to do. This is, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing my job here. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And he's not, and he's picking up my stuff. But it was me. It was me that the Lord was saying, this is you. This is your righteousness. You, you don't have anything. You are worse than him. You are so much worse than him. But you're nothing. In, and I'm just saying, God, you know, forgive me. You know, he's Continuing to, to, to deal with me on that on that one issue and just seeing the whole circumstance unfold. And there's a lot more to it, but you know, it's <laughs> well that's it was hard. Yeah. Well, and you know it always is because there's usually a mixture of our flesh and, and our carnal mind, <clears throat> but 
you, you can bring every thought into subjection to the lamb and you can say, I'm, I want, you know, it's not like, you know, uh, it, it's more like I believe, help my unbelief. It's more like, um, Lord, I want to be with you and, you know, I've still got issues, but I, I believe that you want me there more than I want to be there. And I'm asking you to not let me out. This that same thing, see? And this is really the deal. This is the, this, what he's describing here is the deal that God is doing right now. Don't let us up. Don't be afraid of correction. Don't be afraid of the Lord staying on your case or me or whatever. Know that I'm doing it out of love and I'm doing it because that's what I'm getting from the boss. You know, so I'm getting from the one you love. And, um, and it's what we need. We do. And you know why? Because we do love the Lord and he knows it. And he believes he can get more out of this than what we're given right now. He believes that. That means he believes in us that there's, there's the right heart in there, but he's got to get the heart to the forefront and get the head or the emotions to the background, you know. And to do that, folks, he, to do that, he has to bring up stuff like what Joseph was talking about. He has to put stuff in your face, you know. And, uh, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've got a long way to go too, but I, one thing I've learned is when junk gets in my face, you know, I don't like it or I don't think this, that's whatever and all this stuff. My immediate reaction is always to step back and to get with the Lord. Always. I don't know. I mean, I don't. It's like the only thing that is important at this moment is not that. It's me. It's me. I need to make sure because, see, I can stand up here and say, well, I love the Lord, and I want the Lord, and da-da-da-da. I can tell you that all day long. And you can believe me because you don't see me in crisis or whatever. But being in this little group, you get to see the pastor a little more in crisis than you would, you know, normally. But nonetheless, you know, it's not what anybody else thinks or what they're looking at to me. It is, I really do want Jesus. I'm not joking. I'm not just giving you preacher talk. I'm after the Lord, and doggone it, I want to grab some of you and take you with me. I mean, that's the way I feel. And it's like, you know, it's like, you know, awake thou sluggard, you know, it's like, I, I want to just slap you a few times and just get you to go, and then say, come on, let's go, you know, draw us, Jesus, we will run, you know, and, and I just, I want that passion you know, that passion for Jesus to override this stuff enough that we keep our heart steady. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay. of Abraham. It's the faith that includes, I'm dead and can't do it, but that's not the end of it. And then it is that Christ, you will form and bring him forth, and I believe in life out of death. And that's what's going to happen. Scott? Yeah. I, one of the things that the Lord's really been speaking to my heart is looking back at the Israelites, you know, when they were taking the land, and, you know, the things that they encountered, the obstacles were real obstacles. They were, you know, iron chariots and different things like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, the Lord puts those there to test our resolve. 
you know, and, I, and, and you know, just the heart of David, you know, those, you know, the, uh, oh, what were they, the Gibeonites that had been in Jerusalem, you know, all those years, and it didn't matter to David. It you know, it's like, it doesn't matter if, if this, if it's been this way for years and years and years, nevertheless, David took, you know, took the strong old design. And that's just, you know, the faith that's been rising up in my heart is that it doesn't matter. Those obstacles do not matter. Mm -hmm. If we are looking, if we keep looking at the Lord and keep trusting the Lord, then we're going to break through those things no matter how long they've been. Mm -hmm. Well, and then, you know, just to, just a reminder, we talked about true death is like in Ezekiel with the, with the dry, valley of dry bones. And there's no flesh on those bones. And so the issue is never, especially in this season, is never what's right there in front of us that's bugging us. It's, I need to cut off the flesh off of me. I need to be the one that is, you know, skinned and cut back and all of that so that Christ may bring forth out of a true death. You know? Yeah, Mel. Thoughts, and the best way to describe it would be, I guess, Hebrews 11. You have all these people who, by faith, acted. Even when they were without strength to see, right. or even when they didn't have it in them to do, there was a step that was still made. And it wasn't like, I have faith, I'm just going to wait here until it happens. You know, Abraham couldn't have a child, but they still went to the land and stayed there. You know, they didn't just close the region. But, I mean, there was an act that says because they looked for a city whose will their neighbor is God. It was an impossible situation, but there was a movement that affected their actions, even though they didn't have the strength or the ability to bring forth the ultimate thing. And it's kind of like, we can't walk on water either, but Peter got on the boat anyway. Yeah. And there's got to be a move, if you love the Lord, there's a move to step out into the impossible, even when the strength isn't there. It's not works. It's a real trust that there's got to be something more than just, yeah, I trust the Lord. There's a trust that moves to action into the impossible situation, knowing that it is the will of God and He will bring it forth. And I know that at times I have missed that, and it's kept to me in a holding pattern with reference to being from the engine. Sometimes I'm just kind of waiting for it to happen. You know, instead of going against my flesh and trusting it's going to be Christ, I'm cutting off that flesh and stepping out. That's the only thing left is Christ. <laughs> you know? Right. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I don't need it to sound like works or zeal. There's got to be some kind of movement. He doesn't yeah. move if there's no movement, you know. Yeah, I think there's some basic things that, because we all, I mean, this thing that Joseph described and Carolyn described, and, you know, I, I just think there's some basic things. Um, one is, is probably the first is, hey, when we... When someone's doing something wrong or somebody's messing up or somebody's messing with you or whatever, the first thing we do is spew. We do. The first thing we do is use our mouth and we tell somebody, I've got to tell somebody that, you know, or I've got to say it. I've just got to get it out. I've, I've got to say this, you know. And that's what, that's what you, a lot of people, a lot of Christians use prayer meetings for. Just they, that's their opportunity to say it and just vomit on everybody and stuff like that. The second one, and I'm sure there's, there's you know, but, you know. Don't be hasty. Don't do anything hasty. Don't take action right off because it's like, okay, it's, I, I know this is hard to understand, but it's like, Here's this situation, and here's this pristine little lake or pond that God has put between you and it. And the first thing you do is throw up in it, and then you start wading out in there to get over there and fix the thing and take hold of it. And it's muddy the water, and now you've got vomit and mud all over you and all this. God's going, and you're going, oh, Lord, just bring forth the lamb in me. Uh, why, you know, could you just... You know, so, so one thing that helps on that deal is really hard, but it's, but it's really, I, you know, and again, my experience is nothing, but, 
you know, if I haven't learned anything, I've learned to wait on the Lord. I hear stuff, I do not react. I do not react. Y'all have seen me enough. Surely you've seen me enough to say I just don't. I just don't react. You know, and but but the most important one is is that thing I was trying to describe. Man, if I really want Jesus, if I really want Jesus, I need to wait. I need to. You know, it's like we say, okay, don't do anything hasty. Okay, well, on the cross, your hands and your feet, you know, and over your mind is all crucified. But that's the problem. We're just Christians down here on the earth looking at stuff and trying to deal with stuff instead of being one with Jesus in this message where it becomes more than a message to us. It becomes my Jesus in us. Christ in us in this way, but there, but, but it, these, you know, just a few of these little steps. And I'm sure there's more, and you know, I don't even know, that I don't even know, but I just know some of the things that have really, really worked for me. And this, this thing of keeping my mouth shut, man, oh man, you know, people assume that I tell Deb everything because she's my wife. I don't, not at all, not at all. She's, she may be my wife. But she's not the wife of the pastor. She's the wife of Randy. Okay? Not only that, I'm a pastor and I've been gifted with everything to be able to handle this stuff. Not that it always feels like that. But I have been. And she's not a pastor. She's not, you know, she doesn't have all that equipment to be able to handle it. So for me to just dump it on her, I could destroy her by doing all of that, that stuff. And so I, I you know, and I, I remember who was it? Someone was talking to me, oh, three or four or five years ago, and they said, well, well, who do you talk to when you're going through stuff? I said, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean there's a real Jesus you can talk to about stuff? <laughs> yeah, they didn't say that. But I mean, it was kind of the, the, the thing, it was like, well, that's not enough, really. It's, it, it works pretty good because anybody else I would dump on is not going to have what it takes to be able to, you know, they, they're not a pastor. They don't have the equipment. God equips you, and they don't have it. And so it is, you know, what is it then? It's just my flesh needing an outlet, so I'm going to just dump on one of y'all, you know. People say, well, you don't really share a lot, you know. Um, you know, is it because you were an orphan? <laughs> I'm going, no, it's because you can't handle the truth. <laughs> and, then, and then the haste thing, some of y'all remember, I think I really got that settled in me when we were in, on uh, Maple. Remember when the Bible school first started and the Lord really was dealing with me on haste and I just started, y'all remember that? I was, I really, you know, I was preaching a lot, but just, just know this. Anytime I'm preaching something a lot, it's something that the Lord is really trying to work in me, and I want to get it in me. But anyway, so it's, so uh, he was just kept saying, don't, you know, don't move. You know, it's like, uh, but, I, but I'm the pastor. I should fix this. If, if I don't fix it, people are going to go, well, what kind of pastor are you? Da, 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 da. Well, anybody ever thought that about me? You know. Sure you have, and I don't blame you. But I'd rather be with Jesus and be right. And, and all those things, they're no longer issues, aren't they? <laughs> that I should have. you got to get on this, you know. They're no longer issues. God death with them. God moves. God eventually, you know, and he doesn't do it in our time. When your obedience is fulfilled, then he's ready to punish all disobedience. Well, why is it taking so long? Your obedience isn't fulfilled, you know. Yes. We know when we're in our flesh, and you know that haste of wanting to say even the right thing, right? Or even lay down your life in a way to where you're saying it, you're saying it. If I feel that thing in my spirit where I, where it's my flesh, yeah, then I need to be quiet until it's the Lord. Or if it's not the Lord, don't ever say anything. That's right. Because if I do say anything and it's not it's not Him and it's me. Yeah, I can go, well, I laid down my life, and this was the Lord, and, uh, and I hands off. 
the Lord's like, well, I wasn't, I didn't do that. Right. That was you. That's right. That was you doing that, you know, and it's not even worth it. It's not even worth it. It's, you know, just leave and go live in the world. If, you, if you're not going to be one too. with the Lord in it and allow it to be Him, then it doesn't do any good to the person you're laying down your life for, and it doesn't do any good for Him at all. Right. And it, and it, it negates the sacrifice of Christ completely. Praise God. That's, that's, that is... That is said so correctly that it negates the sacrifice of Christ that would have been a beautiful thing to the Father. And we're so full of pride and everything that we got to do something because this ruffles my feathers or this offends me or this, you know, whatever. And Jesus, he took the slaps and he took the beating and he took all of that and he did it for us and he did it out of love, but we can't do that. We can't do that for someone else. I'm sorry, I can't do that. He was the son of God. Well, he's supposed to live in us. But then we're negating that. And, uh, you know, the problem is, see, I just, I just wonder if we really see the true faith that, that what God calls faith. Because if we really see it, then we know this is the, I'm justified by what he did. Now I need to, the, the just shall live. Now I need to live by this. But there's a Christianity that has found a way to be justified by it and not live by it. And that's not, that doesn't bring glory to the Father. It's just a bunch of saved fleshlings then. You know? And the end result is what? There's no resurrection out of that. And, you know, I mean, I know you're thinking, well, I want to be resurrected in the last day or something. You know, Jesus said, forget, you, you know, you'll be resurrected, you know, you know, I know he'll be resurrected in the last day, but I am the resurrection and you're cheating me out of being that in you. You're so happy that you're going to get to be resurrected that you're, you know, and you're, you haven't, and you have no thought for me. You have no thought for my plan. You have no thought for, for what true oneness means. You have no thought for these things. They don't even enter your mind. It's like, well, you know, we're, we're just like Judah being surrounded by the Babylonians or being carried away in chains and marching a huge distance all the way to Babylon, and we're going, this isn't right, this isn't right. You people are wrong. God, why, could, why would God allow such a thing? What kind of God would allow this? We're the people of God. They're, they're horrible creatures, and look at the stuff that they do and everything. We just, we just violated the sacrifice. And I don't know. Anyway, my next paragraph here was along that line. Uh, there are two things they didn't believe that I mentioned. Uh, Judah in uh, captivity or headed that direction. Second, their belief system was different from God's. Therefore, they were in confusion concerning the whole Babylonian fiasco. And that's it. See, Jesus was represented by Jerusalem that died. And by, by you remember that? All the way back in the beginning classes? that he died and they went into captivity so he could bring them back to his original intention. But had they been with him and had oneness been in their minds, they would have laid down their life, but they didn't. They just wanted to be the, the receivers of the benefits and stuff. Uh, God believed that taking them down into his chosen death would be their hope for resurrection. See, God, God believed that taking them down into this captivity and everything would be the hope for their resurrection. It would be a lesser death than, than Jerusalem being destroyed. Just like any death that we lay down our life to is a lesser death than what Jesus did. Come on. I mean, not even comparable. But we ought to be able to give the Father a little bit of that Jesus that we have, shouldn't we? You know, yeah.
ups. I think it does. I've done it. You know, some kind of talking experience with the okay. axe to grind here. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, it's really too bad when we make it like such a big eye playing on like there's so many people on our name. Who's the problem? It's the Lord. Like it was like, really, that's like kind of nothing actually. I mean, He's, you know look, he's, he's looking at you from his cross over to you on yours and going, uh, that ain't the one. <laughs> and it's just really too bad because it kind of shows that it's power. Again. Yeah, and it does. I guess self is in Okay, so the, the Babylonian or the uh, Judah, uh, they mistakenly believe that God's plan was to save their flesh. And we really think that. I mean, we go, oh, and our flesh is what? Our soul. Well, my soul is going through this and save my soul, you know? And he goes, you know, I've saved your spirit. And that's, you do realize that what we call being saved, getting your soul saved is really your spirit being saved. And then your soul must line up with Christ crucified, with the lamb. And then your soul is saved. But you know, we're just—it's our emotions and our—and and if it's not our emotions, it's our our ironclad thinking that says everything has to be this way and that way and everything, you know. And um, I tell you what, there's st- there's stuff you have to give up that's you, and you say, "But this is my good stuff," and he says, "This this is," you know. Um, <clears throat> they thought God wanted to preserve that which was holy. Oh, they thought God wanted to preserve that which was holy and special to himself. Jerusalem, in parentheses, I put Christ crucified. He doesn't want to preserve the most holy thing. God, Remember that in the 8th chapter of Romans? God, who spared not his own son, he gave up the most holy thing. And we're going, oh, no, I want to protect, you know. I'm just trying to stand up for the Lord while I you know, blame you and have them drag you off and beat you to death. (laughs) Lord, help us. Uh, But contrary to that, God wanted to bring about a new Jerusalem, Christ in his resurrected body. In other words, he willingly gave up Jerusalem, believing that life comes out of death. It's the faith of Abraham It's the faith that Christ exercised. And he gave up in the Babylonian captivity, he gave up Jerusalem knowing that in resurrection he would get a new Jerusalem. And that's Christ with his resurrected body, us. See? So so I'm telling you, he functions by this because not big, you know, I'm trying to... I'm trying to make it clear that this isn't really like a faith that's working in him as much as it is just his nature. But by seeing it as the faith, we understand we have to operate by faith. We ha- and what does that mean? We have to see this clearly and we have to make it our walk and our life. It is how we're supposed to function. And if we're not, then we're just, we say, okay, I'm justified by faith. And, and what that means is, I believe Jesus died, so I won't have to die. He gets to die. I don't have to die. And he died, and he took my punishment, so I don't have to get punished. He gets all the punishment. So this is really, I love this justification by faith thing. My faith is he gets to suffer everything, and I get all the benefits of it. I love this faith. I am a believer. And God's going, you have misread everything. You've misread everything. Man, you know, you people, I am not getting very far in these classes. <laughs> yeah, but this is this feels even worse to me. I don't know why. Well, I guess here you know, here's why here's why it feels worse. This is the third, you know, semester of this one course, and I feel so much from the Lord still, just incredible amounts, just incredible, and real stuff that if I can get said, it'll at least be seeds that can go in you, and the Holy Spirit can bring it back up, you know, and so it's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going too slow here. Sorry, it just takes me a second to. I'm 
make sure I can find my way. All right. Um, This is a long title, but it'd be comparing the faith of Abraham with uh, the uh, captivity of Judah. You know, I, and we can. No, thanks. We can shut everything off. Um, but I just want to say, you know, you know, the enemy really doesn't want us to do this. Y'all do realize that, don't you? I mean, he really doesn't. Okay. And he's capable of, of hitting us with big stuff. And right now, honestly, I know, but it, it's not big stuff yet. <laughs> It's not. We're just barely, it, we've just barely stepped inside. It'd be like wanting to go to the Holy of Holies. We're going, let's go to the Holy of Holies. I want to get in there. We just step in the thing and the altar's still in front of us. <laughs> you know, got to die first. <laughs> you know, and going, I already did that. You know? Well, in truth, Christ did it. He took us to the cross and we are dead. You don't have to die. You're dead. That's settled. Okay. But you do need to understand, number one, you, not to understand, you need God to unveil the altar before he unveils the Holy of Holies. And I think we know it, and, and it's a lot of this is my fault because I teach it and... You know, believe it or not, I actually don't try to teach where everything is absolutely crystal clear and practical. I don't. I, I, I try to throw junk in there so that you'll have to go to the Holy Spirit, <laughs> you know. And I've been accused of, well, out of all of our teachers, Randy is the only one. He's just pie in the sky and everything. Good. You know, you've got to get it from the Holy Spirit. You've got to. But, but when... When the opportunity gives itself, when it, when it presents itself, God, you've got to take it. Do you all understand that? We're not going to go anywhere if when the opportunity presents itself, you don't grab it, you don't take it, you don't, you know, jump in. And, and that's everything from, um, you know, Patty had mentioned to call me a couple of days ago and said, you know, we really want to, me and Mike are hungry, and, and I believe that. I believe y'all are. And this, I said, can I, you know, is there any way I could bring them into the class? And I said, yes, if somehow they can basically be quiet because I would be willing to suffer some just so that y'all can get it because I believe your hearts, and I, I want you here, you know. Um, <laughs> That's trying. That's grabbing. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? That's that's saying I want to be there. Then you know, and you know there's there's going to be stuff. You know, I, Scott's brother just came in from Washington. hadn't seen him in years, and he drove for how many hours? And you know, thirty hour drive and all this kind of stuff. And there he sits. You know, and I know I know your heart. I know where you want to be. I know you want to be here. I know you don't want to miss one thing. And I, and, uh, and I believe that of all of us. But, you know, it's everything from uh, family to, and, and you all know I'm always trying to push you all towards your family. I always excuse anything that I can give you towards your family. I've always been that way. That's not new. But I'm just saying maybe we need to be a little more careful. Just this because, you know, it's family this week, and then, well, you're sick this week, and then, well, the kids are this or that or whatever, and pretty soon you're out, you know, you're out of the thing. It's like a, it's like, it's like a, 
a, a stream, a river flowing down, and, and you have those river rocks, and they're sitting in the ones that are in that flow, man, they're getting smoothed out, and all their sharp, pointy places that poke everybody and stuff, they're being smoothed out and stuff. But you have these, these pools that form along the side, and they just get in there, and it gets stagnant, and the water just kind of stops flowing and everything. You got rocks in there, and they're still sharp, and they're still, you know, they're still pokey. You reach in there, you can still cut your hand on it and stuff like that. And it's not one you'd pick up and say, look, let me skip this across. You know, you get this smooth. One. How, do you, how, do you, how do you get that? You have to stay in the flow. You can't get caught up in little side pools. You have, to get, you have to stay in the flow of what God's doing. And I don't know, I don't know of another time that I've felt this strong. Maybe there was, and it's been so long <laughs> that I don't remember it. But I know that this is one of the top important things that I'm sensing from the Lord. And so I'm just, you know, I know there's only a few of us and everything, but just asking you, just let's stay with it. Let's keep the pace. Let's keep the pace with the Lord. Let's not drop back and make him slow down. He's done that for us for years. Let's try, you know, that was, the, you know, that was the thing about Enoch. He walked with God. He kept God's pace. Those were some big steps, and he kept up with him. And what happened? He was taken, you know. You know, but most of us, we, we're, we're like little kids, and we have to make the Father slow down for us, which is fine, and he does that. And, and, but I'm saying, I'm wondering if this is one of those times. I don't think he's wanting us to drag him back and slow down. I think he's saying, come on, you can do it. I'm going to set a pace, and I want you to stay with me. So I'm just asking you to keep praying and keep, keep your hearts open and keep hungry and keep realizing where we're going. And, you know, these uh, Sunday morning times, too, with Esther, they're, gonna, they're, they're right on, man. I'm telling you, here's the amazing thing. I've only done, what, three of them so far, two? I don't even remember two. And those two... I know from the Lord we're right on, and next Sundays will be right on, right on time. And what's funny is that I that He started giving me this some time back on Esther to share, and it's like He's giving it here, He's giving it here. But now, Randy, you let me give it now to them, and it's just the right time. I'm telling you, keep keep your antenna, keep your hearts tuned. Father, we just, we just love you, and we come to you in Jesus' name to, to all of us to, together to just kneel down in our hearts before you and to say we want you, Jesus. We're sorry that we lag behind. We're sorry that we, we make excuses. We, we're sorry that we allow others to, to dictate when and where instead of you. And, Lord, we just ask you that you'll just keep your spirit upon us and keep him moving in us and keep this this passion going and and uh, father that uh, that that different ones that are here lord um will will just begin to melt into you in that manner it'll it'll not be a work very long it'll be oneness but lord for the for this time period there is a there is a time to search the scriptures or to to stick a tape or a CD or something into our car and just listen to the word or or Lord just in any manner Lord go to sleep having a teaching or the word the scriptures going uh, on CD or something and uh, Lord trusting that your spirit is going to take that and he's going to quicken us more powerfully than he would have if we just ignored all of these small things Lord, and just like the three things we wrote on the board, so small, so so small in light of your greatness. But, Lord, we want to be faithful in that which is least, and you'll give us more. So, Lord, help us, help us to, to keep our mouths shut. Lord, help us not to be so hasty to act when we see stuff. And, and Lord, just help us, Lord, just help us on every front to wait and to know that you've got a timing and that we can trust you and that we can trust you, that we can have faith that as we walk with you in life 
out of death, that we'll see resurrection. So bless us in, in these things that you're drawing us to. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, folks, I love you.